Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to uh, be back. Um, here are my disclosures. Uh, I'm an advisory board member, but uh, Mayo gets all the money. I don't profit personally. So these are the things that I do outside of uh, urology or in urology. We're going to talk a little bit about BPH and bladder obstruction. It's important to think methodologically. We used to think clean the obstruction, takes care of the patient. We have to change the way we frame it and think about it. Traditionally, we focused on alleviating bothersome uh, symptoms from prostate enlargement. Now we have to think about altering the disease progression and how do we interact at an earlier time. And what I mean by that is, as everybody knows, the lower urinary tract symptoms is such a garbage bin of different diagnoses and symptoms, everywhere from overactive bladder to nocturia, to bladder tumors can do this, foreign bodies, all of these things can play a role in lower urinary tract symptoms. But when we think about it, now we have to start thinking about the entire urinary tract, not just the one thing we're trying to affect, including the sensory afferent uh, nerves as we go through this. So what do we mean by lower urinary tract symptoms? We're talking about both storage symptoms, voiding symptoms, and then post-micturition symptoms. And we're really gonna focus on some of the early ones, and then we're also gonna focus on really the nocturia as part of this, because there's been a couple new things in that particular field. So um, this is gonna be germane later. What is the most bothersome symptom with the highest quality of life impact? This was a cross-sectional study of 20,000 uh, individuals across Italy, Germany, and the Netherlands, and they took men and women, and it was almost 20,000 people, and they just said, what bothers you the most? You can see all the overlapping circles. You can see how overactive bladder is so prevalent among these complications. But the number one rated symptom that was most impactful in their quality of life, both men and women, was actually nocturia. It's the number one symptom, and we see it day in and day out in our office. So when we talk about this, I'm just gonna talk about if this whole graph of increasing efficacy versus invasiveness, when we're talking about medical therapy, when we talk about alpha blockers, reductase inhibitors, PD-5 inhibitors, everybody in here is familiar with that, so I'm gonna rush through this very quickly. But these are mostly aimed at bladder outlet obstruction, but there's some other things that we can do with it. Everybody's also familiar with our anti-muscarinic and our beta blockers. Um, but let's talk about this. How did these therapies come along? And it's really interesting to study the timeline when you look at these and you look at the major studies and when the government got improved. What you see from prescribing habits, and this is all men about a decade ago, and all providers, alpha blockers really carried the day. And you can see some of these different trials and troughs based on when the MTOPS trial results were published and all these various things. But when you really look down here at the trends, what we're starting to see a lot more of is the alpha blockers, the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, um, starting to take more of a present effect, really focusing in on that combo therapy. And I think we're even starting to see more we're doing anti-muscarinics and something to alleviate the out at the same time. We all know alpha-1 adrenergic blockers, they reduce the IPS, they increase the Qmax, prostate size doesn't really uh, change the efficacy, they seem to be better for smaller glands, but importantly, they don't prevent the acute urinary retention in long-term studies. We all know about this from the original trials. When we start to get into the uroselective, this is where we start to use a little bit of science to help us, specifically with psilocin. Um, it has a higher reduction outlet than any other alpha-1 antagonist. Um, and the important thing about it is, is it's 38 more selective for the alpha-1A subtype receptor. And you think, why is that important compared to Flomax? And what's the important part? Well, you get equivalent improvement in your lower tract symptoms, but most importantly, what it does is you decrease the nocturia in patients by about 10%. So if you're gonna use an alpha blocker and they've got nocturia, this would be the, uh, this, the instant one to go to. And so we can use some of that science to help us a little bit. We also talk about PD-5 inhibitors. We see people coming in with these all the time. It's great for those men with a little bit of ED as well as lower urinary tract symptoms. But when you really think about how these work, they increase the vascular perfusion of the pelvic organs, and it reduces the urgency via the afferent nerve modulation pathway. So they do more than just deal with the erectile function. So when you listen to your patients and you're hearing what their symptoms are, this is another nice medication that may be one of your first case. It depends what their providers do in their insurance, but depending what their constellation of symptoms are, this could be very valuable for you and your patients. Anticholinergics, I think we've dispelled the old myths where those men 
Um, with blood outlet obstruction, we don't want to give them anticholinergics. It's shown through multiple studies that those with high PVRs of over 250, 300, you have to use them with caution, but otherwise in the randomized control trials, the rate of urinary retention with these was similar on whether or not um, they had outlet obstruction. So I think what that does is that gives us a safety margin for some of those irritative and storage symptoms that men have. Um, beta blockers, these are the newest kids on the block. Um, and, and I think that what's nice about these compared to the other ones, I tend to see a little bit less of the side effects from these, the dry mouth, the constipation. And what we really notice is an increased storage capacity in their bladder. So when we start to talk about lower urinary tract symptoms and their frequency, this seems to be something um, more efficacious in that particular population. Um, I want to say a few things about nocturia as we wrap this up a little bit. Um, importantly, it's not a disease unless we're talking about polydipsia, nocturia, and some of those things that actually are a disease. And when we talk about the definition, it's essentially two or more times per night. And interesting, nocturia is more prevalent in women until about age 60, and then the prevalence takes over in men. And 50% of adults over 50 to 79 have nocturia. The most important thing that I say to patients when they have this, the two questions, do you snore and do you have lower extremity edema? Do you have sock lines at the end of the day? And it's shocking how many do. And once you treat their peripheral edema, their CHF, or their sleep apnea, how much of their nocturia goes away. What's interesting about nocturia, these were a couple trials that got a lot of um, play recently. One was the REDUCE trial, and they noted the association of mortality with nocturia. This was about 7,300 men, and after controlling for demographic and medical comorbidities, they saw an increased mortality risk of nocturia. Now, one of the criticisms of this is obviously this study was not looked at and was not designed to look at uh, nocturia. That wasn't an endpoint, but it still is an interesting endpoint. When you look at the meta-analysis, there was another meta-analysis published for all adults looking at nocturia, and they defined it as greater than two. The problem, one of the other problems with the reduced trial in this particular paper is they des described nocturia as greater than three episodes per night. And I don't know if that's just because that it was a cleaner cut point for their data, because it's not really a contemporary definition. But the meta-analysis controlling for everything greater than two had an all-cause mortality. So I think now we're starting to see more of an impact in urology, where nocturia may not just be a problem, but rather a symptom of some other physiologic problem going on with our patients. And so we need to think about that, and it needs to garner some of our attention. Obviously, everybody knows the initial treatments, redoing, reducing fluids, avoiding PM or evening diuretics, treating edema, double voiding, you know, bedside urinals, all of these kind of things are common. The thing that's new, just in the last year, there were two new drugs approved by the FDA in 2018, analogs of desmopressin. Um, one of them is a sublingual tablet, and the other one is a nasal spray. The nice thing about these versus the old DDABP tablets that we used to give kids when they had enuresis is that these bypass the GI metabolism. So it's a much more predictable bioavailability in our patients. And when you looked at the data of these uh, trials, you get about 33% reduction in voids no matter which one you do. They say with the sublingual tablets for women, you should start with 25, and men, you should start with 50. Obviously, you have to take into account their size. With the nasal spray, it's just one spray and a nostril um, per night. But the most important thing is you look at all cause of hyponatremia. That's the big thing that you have to watch for. So you have to look for those contraindications. Those patients that have already had hyponatremia, those patients that are over 65, low renal function, those kind of things, uncontrolled hypertension. But really, the risk is somewhere between 3 or 4%. I've read some reports up to 7%, but it is important to monitor. Get that sodium at baseline, get it at one week, one month, and then I recommend six months thereafter. But these are, these are some nice little adjuncts um, that have come out in recently that uh, patients have responded fairly well to. So with that, that is lots of nocturia in 10 minutes.